Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at the kind of reboot of Evil Dead, released in 2013. I say kind of, because director Fede Alvarez, who would go on to make Don't Breathe, has said that this movie takes place 30 years after the original, even though we're seeing a lot of the same things play out all over again. His explanation is that the Necronomicon can somehow influence events and make them reoccur, sort of like history repeating itself, if you will. So yeah, this could be a remake, a sequel, whatever you want, really. We already know these movies aren't sticklers for continuity. As you probably know by now, I have a high standard when it comes to remakes. I'm gonna be a little harder on a movie if it's recreating something that's already been created. Sorry not sorry. Luckily, this movie very clearly has a purpose for existing. It takes all the over-the-top gore of the original Evil Dead and plays it completely straight. Like yeah, that first movie wasn't comedic like the sequels, but it was still pretty campy. This remake though? It's out to scare the piss out of you. Also, bonus points for not trying to have another Ash Williams. Ain't no one can fill out that chin like Bruce Campbell. How many kills will it take for this requel to terrify us? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins in everyone's favorite haunted woods, where a teenage girl staggers around dripping blood from her hands. But mom always said not to go bleeding in a forest, lest you want a bag over your head and a shotgun butt to the face. That girl should listen to mama. She wakes up bound to a wooden pillar in a room with way too many dead cats for my liking. Poor kitties. An older woman reads aloud from the all-new Necronomicon until a bespectacled fellow steps up and removes the bag from the teenager's head. Daddy? Aw, we got ourselves a family reunion in the woods. That's nice. Except Papa tells his daughter that she killed her mom. That's not nice. And the spectators in the cabin encourage him to save her soul through the only method they know. So he apologizes to his daughter while dousing her in fuel. And as he gets ready to light a match, his extreme measures are validated. Oh, you're so loud, you pathetic! The dead-eyed teenager keeps swearing at her pops as she burns there against the pillar, melting down to an Anakin Skywalker condition until her dad finally finishes off the kill and this cold open with a shotgun blast that blows apart her head. Yeah, that is one epic fucking title card. A bunch of beautiful aerial shots show a jeep driving through a lot of forest and crossing a babbling brook to arrive at its remote location, an old wooden cabin with a work shed that, are we sick of yet after all these movies? Hell no, nah, we ain't sick of this shit. Bring on the book and the deadites, man. Driving the jeep is, sadly, the movie's most boring couple of characters, David Allen and his girlfriend Natalie. They meet with much more interesting peeps, Olivia the nursing student, played by Gotham's Jessica Lucas, and Eric the high school teacher, who was once close with David, but has since grown distant and bitter. They've all gathered here to help David's sister Mia, currently hanging out on the hood of the abandoned, overgrown classic, and played by Jane Levy of the criminally underrated Suburgatory. She's rocking an MSU sweatshirt and a mean addiction to heroin, which is why everyone has come to this cabin, to witness her ditch the habit down a well and help her get cleaned up cold turkey. And here, Mia, maybe this magnifying glass necklace will help you out. It's done a lot for other characters in the past. The cabin belongs to David and Mia's family, although when they get to the door, it appears as though someone has broken in and left it quite a mess. Probably that damn Sam Raimi. That boy will do all sorts of nonsense to get his movies made. Although they were once close, Mia and David now have a tense relationship, since he wasn't around to help her when their mom died in the hospital. He also wasn't around for the last time Mia tried to clean herself up, as Olivia and Eric tell him out on the porch. On that occasion, she bailed and started using again. But this time, they don't want to let that happen. David, when she breaks, and believe me, she will, we don't want to let her leave. Mia breaks pretty much immediately, because on the very first night, she's a screaming sweaty mess who can't stand an awful smell coming from somewhere inside the cabin. But there is something dead. And it reeks. Her dog, Grandpa, finds where it may be coming from, a bloody hatch in the floor underneath a rug. The boys head down there, and of course there's a back room to explore. But sadly, no Freddy Krueger claws hanging on the wall this time. The back room ends up being that place from the cold open, full of poor dead kitties hanging in there, and the funeral pyre of that teenage deadite. The centerpiece of it all, of course, is a scary book wrapped in a garbage bag and barbed wire. Naturally, they bring it upstairs and lay it to rest on their shotgun table. Eric is the most intrigued by the new lit, even though he recognizes the witchy setting in which it was found. Still, he just can't help himself from freeing it of its restraints. And once he does, we've got ourselves a stitched up fleshy Book of the Dead. No face in it this time through, but you know, never judge a Book of the Dead by its cover. Besides, it's what's on the inside that counts. And on the inside is a message that Eric promptly ignores, as well as some neat illustrations and some hidden words that Eric is able to uncover through science. Although another warning in the book says not to say these words, he fucking does, of course. And that gives us a first-person evil spirit in the woods that finds Mia and flashes something so evil at her that she winds up puking on the ground. And her little bout of cabin sickness is the least of her problems, too. 
<laughs> yeah, that's gonna send you packing, whether you've got withdrawals or not. But Olivia's not willing to grant me a bail, since the last time she ran out on recovery, she wound up ODing so bad that she legally died for a little bit. When David sides with Olivia and Eric, Mia rips up the magnifying glass necklace strap and takes the keys to leave on her own. Oh, and hey, Natalie's in the back on the porch there. I almost forgot she was even at the cabin. Mia's hatchback flight through the rain is stopped by an unmarked demon X thing that sends her flying off the road and crashing into a watery ditch. When she comes to, she finds the car totally wrecked and a swamp demon totally scary. She takes off, pursued by a first-person evil spirit, until she winds up with tree branches and vines wrapped around her limbs. It's another familiar sight, and just a heads up, we're gonna get more Evil Dead 1 here than Evil Dead 2. Apparently, the scene wasn't in the initial screenplay that Alvarez co-wrote with Roto Saigas, but then an unnamed producer, probably Robert Tapper, told them that they needed to include the iconic scene in their remake. Things are a little different this time through, because while the vines and tree branches hold Mia in place, a Samara-esque demon girl appears in front of her and has a bit of her own cabin fever, puking up a real nasty, uh, I, I don't know, evil tentacle, I guess? That slithers over to Mia and up her legs. Mia and the entity share a scream. <laughs> David and Olivia find Mia and take her back to the cabin, where they dismiss her story as hallucinations from withdrawal and an attempt to manipulate them into letting her go. From now on, she is gonna do whatever it takes to get out of here. I do like that this movie offers a strong justification as to why they don't want to leave the cabin and why they don't believe the first victim. It's simple, but effective. And it's why David refuses to take Mia back home even after she begs him with the most scared face I've ever seen on a human being. It's okay, Mia. I don't think there's actually anything in this cabin that'll... Oh dear God! Eric takes to further studying the Necronomicon, probably because he's a high school teacher and just wants to read something other than Catcher in the Rye for once. Meanwhile, David finds Grandpa Dog dead and bloody beneath the work shed, and seeing a gory hammer nearby, assumes that his junkie sister is the canine killing culprit. He charges into the cabin, where Mia's taking a shower, but instead of getting grilled by her brother about a dead dog, she boils herself by turning up the heat and scalding a whole bunch of her skin off. Does your new favorite book say anything about that, Eric? Oh, yep, here it is, chapter six. The Old Viceroy. Maneuver. David finally tries to drive his scalded puking sister back to civilization, but he has to stop the jeep when he finds the road out of there flooded. I mean, the sign warned you, dude. It's right there. Everyone is getting rightfully worried, even though David tries to assuage their concerns. Everything's gonna be fine. Everything's gonna be fine. Everything's gonna be fine. I don't know if you'd noticed this, but, but nothing has been fine. Yeah, Eric's not a believer, and looks like the evidence is on his side, since Mia walks into the room twitching all kinds of crazy and holding a goddamn shaka. She shoots it right past David's head, which I guess serves as an invitation for an evil spirit to break down the door and come into the cabin. We're treated to a cameo sound clip of Cheryl from the original Evil Dead, with Mia adding her own personalized punctuation. You are all going to die tonight. She passes out, and when Olivia tries to secure the gun, Mia stops her, pounces on her, and pukes a whole bucket's worth of blood right into her face. Aw, oh, sick nasty. Olivia rolls Mia over into the open cellar hatch, and Eric thinks fast, closing it and climbing on top to keep Mia shut and tight. Hey, what if we gave Natalie a line? Oh my god, what happened to her eyes? Oh, I meant, like, an original one, but, uh... That's okay, I guess. Eric tells David that he thinks Mia's all messed up because of all the witchcraft stuff from the basement. And unfortunately for them, that witchcraft stuff is contagious because Olivia sees a ghastly grinning version of herself in the bathroom mirror. She realizes the image might be reflecting something foretold in the evil book. And next thing you know, she's frozen in place and bugging out a bit. Eric goes to check on her and finds the bathroom light only half working. But his ears are fully functional and the sound they picking up is pretty gross. Olivia. Turns out that's what it sounds like when someone saws their own face off. Holy shit, Olivia! When'd you start doing bath songs? Olivia is now possessed enough to cut off her own cheek, and according to our rules with this series, that means another one for the count. Dead-eyed Olivia attacks the prone Eric and really messes him up good, stabbing him in the chest and beating at his face with a syringe. Good thing you opted for the extra strength glasses there, dude. When Olivia crawls towards him, ready to stab him some more, Eric grabs a broken piece of porcelain and smashes her head over and over until she's no longer moving. It may not be a proper dismemberment or anything, but this does kill the dead-eyed Olivia. Again, different movie, different rules, I guess. David tends to Eric's wounds in the work shed with, uh, wait, what's her name again? Natalie? It doesn't matter. Go on and get. As David patches him up, Eric confesses that he probably brought this all about by reading from the book. I released 
Something evil. <laughs> yeah, you fucking think, dude? Inside the cabin, Natalie hears Mia crying and sounding normal in a classic Deadeye ruse that successfully draws the bland nothing character down the stairs to help her. That's when Mia breaks bad, and although Natalie tries to escape, she's pulled back underground and slammed shut inside. Mia creeps up on Natalie, who tries to grab a box cutter to defend herself with. And that gives us this movie's most memorable moment, when Mia treats that blade like a push pop and licks the edge of it, splitting her tongue in half. The forked tongue Mia then shares a bloody French kiss with Natalie, and even though David comes and rescues his girlfriend from the cellar, we know it's probably too late for her. They chain and nail the cellar door shut and have a good cry sesh on the floor together, while Eric tries to end this misadventure by burning the Book of the Dead. It doesn't work though, because like, obviously, a book from hell is gonna be pretty flame retardant. That durable Naturum de Manto has a lot of conflicting info inside, but all of it does point to one especially evil being. Evil entity, uh taker of souls. And the world's best birthday party planner. He's got a cake and a candle on his head all ready to go. This entity needs to claim five human souls before it can successfully rise from hell. So I guess it's convenient that five idiot teens just happen to roll into its neighborhood. In the kitchen, Natalie examines a bite wound Mia left on her hand, which festers and spreads corruption all the way up her arm. And to make things worse, Natalie's got an audience for this arm enveloping affair. Motherfuck, man! When did Tessa Altman get so scary? Convinced that her hand is a lost cause, Natalie grabs an electric carver from the ground and, to her credit, does what needs to be done. She saws right on in until the bone breaks and the lights go out. Hot damn, this movie don't fuck around. Are you happy with yourself, Mia? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I guess you are. David duct tapes Natalie's stump, and then it's back to the book, which Eric says makes one thing clear. In order to stop this, the possessed must be cleansed. And apparently, there are three ways to cleanse the evilly afflicted. A live burial, complete bodily dismemberment, and that old witch standard, clean and simple immolation. David's understandably reluctant to go with any of these options when it comes to his sister Dearest, so Eric resolves to take care of it himself. Not if Deadite Natalie has anything to say about it, though. Yep, the amputation didn't work, and Natalie instead decided to cosplay as John Ritter from Bride of Chucky by shooting herself in the face with a nail gun. In fact, she found the experience so enjoyable, she thinks the guy should try it too. Natalie, it's cool if you're into body modification, but don't force it on other people. She ends up shooting Eric in the arm a bunch, and David in the leg, and it's not until Eric is a downright human pincushion that David is able to tackle his possessed girlfriend and put an end to the attack. Natalie simply rearms herself, um, not with like another arm, she can't do that, but with a crowbar that she then beats David down with. And when she's bored of hitting him, she turns her attention to Eric, who she beats with the crowbar until his skull is busted open. Before she can take one final fatal swing though, her arm gets shot straight straight off her body by David, who's got the boomstick now. Natalie reverts back to her milk toast human form and confusedly asks David why he's hurting her. I know this is usually a demonic ploy, but in this case, Natalie stays a human and bleeds out to death, never to come back as a dead-eyed again. I know we already counted her possession as a kill, but uh, I don't know man, let's just count her death here as another one? These movies are messy, I said that in the first kill count for him. David takes Eric outside and promises him that he'll do what needs to be done, so he heads back inside and pours gasoline all over the place like he's looking to collect some insurance money. But before he can drop the lighter, Mia starts singing a lullaby to him, and a picture on the wall reminds him of more innocent times, so he comes up with another, less sister Bernie plan. The new plan involves a chainsaw- wait, no, a battery? And some syringes, I guess. He heads down to the cellar, syringe in hand, only to have Mia fly out at him from a corner and cut his arm up with that box cutter. She throws him into a nasty pool of water and starts to drown him, but she's stopped by Eric, who knocks her down with a shovel, which allows David to stick her with the needle. Unfortunately, that fight took the last bit of life out of Eric who dies in a seated position, which has got to be uncomfortable. Er, uh, I didn't mean to put his body down in the water, David. Because that's a, I mean, that's downright disrespectful, dude. It's gonna get moldy! David takes Mia out to a grave he dug and buries her next to a burning tree that was struck by lightning. She's not ready to be put down for a nap, though, and wakes up acting like a regular human being, begging David for help. He doesn't fall for that old trick and instead keeps on a shoveling, not stopping to cry about it until the dirt is level and he can't hear the deadite no more. Fun fact, they actually buried Jane Levy underground for this scene so actor Shiloh Fernandez could be more emotional and urgent during it. When the burning tree goes out, David takes it as a sign that the medicine has run its course, so he digs his sister back up quickly, since again, she was actually buried down there, and uses the battery device he rigged up in the shed to stab her in the chest and try to zap her back to life. It doesn't appear to work at first, and David laments the loss of his loved one, but y'all know how movies work by now, of course she's gonna come back. Besides, I never put her on the count. That should have been a dead-eyed giveaway. Mia comes back from the dead-eyed and is legitimately free of her possession, so is 
is this a happy ending to our story? Mm, not exactly. They've still got to get out of this place, and Dead-Eyed Eric's not about to let that happen. After a next stab with some pliers, David is in real bad condition, and although Mia wants to help him, he ushers her out of the cabin and tells her to go before slamming the door shut and locking her out. As Dead-Eyed Eric approaches, David gets the shotgun and aims it at the gasoline tank. His shot causes an explosion that engulfs the cabin in flames, and Mia watches from outside as her living brother and the Dead-Eyed Eric burn to death inside the cabin. Her consolation prize is an Evil Dead mainstay, but it's still kind of disappointing. I came back from being a Dead-Eyed and all I got was this stupid magnifying glass necklace? Well, if you want more theatrics, how about a biblical rainstorm of blood? Because I guess that even though Mia was able to come back from it, the evil entity did claim five human souls, you know? If you want to be technically correct about it, which is the best kind of correct. With the soul fundraising goal reached, the abomination rises from the earth and chases a blood-soaked Mia into a burrow below the work shed. Pretty shitty hiding place, Mia. I bet it's the first place it'll look. Told you so. Mia crawls into the work shed and finally brings the chainsaw properly into this movie. As she tries to get it started from behind a wall, she faces a bunch of scary machete stabs, a couple of which slice into her skin. Mia gets away by breaking out through the wall of the work shed and hides behind the jeep as the abomination comes out to get her. Beneath the vehicle, she finally gets the chainsaw going and she uses it to cut the abomination's leg off and get it to the ground. In response, the abomination straight flips the jeep onto Mia's hand, crushing it and pinning her to the ground. But Mia's had enough of this shit and, unable to reach the chainsaw from her position, simply musters up the will and the fortitude to pull her arm out from underneath the car, leaving her hand behind as collateral. The abomination crawls over to Mia, not realizing that our final girl has grown into an ash-like kick-ass quipper. I will feast on your soul. On this motherfucker. With that, Mia saws into the abomination's head, and I'm sorry y'all, but this public version on YouTube can't even begin to show the brutality of this kill, so I'll just give you some discreet close-ups. The abomination's zipper-looking corpse sinks into the bloody, muddy earth, and with the evil being vanquished, the sky clears up, and Mia's finally able to wear that magnifying glass necklace in peace. The sun is rising, and humanity is saved, so you can go ahead and close that Book of the Dead. Oh, and after one last severe title card, the movie ends with a post-credit cameo for Mr. Mr. Bubba Hotep himself. Groovy. Good lord, does it even matter how many kills there were when we had gore that crazy intense? Of course it does, we all about them analytics baby. Let's get to the numbers. Right after I look at ants and stuff. Oh, what interesting fine print. And what is that, an atom? I counted nine possessions slash deaths slash whatever in this movie. The victims included two women who got possessed, two dudes who died human, three lady deadite slain, one dude deadite blown up, oh, and the abomination, which is a genderless evil being. Is this the first time we've ever had a five-part pie chart? No, no. With a runtime of 91 minutes, that left us with a victim on average every 10.11 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the abomination, fucking obviously. Sawed in half vertically with a chainsaw? What the fuck else is supposed to win this? Nothing, that's what. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to Eric, who got all tuckered out after his fight with the possessed Mia. Though, to be fair, he had survived like half a dozen fights before that. And that's it. Evil Dead, the kind of sort of remake, came out in 2013 and so far it might be the best remake I've watched. And don't try to bring up the thing, Carpenter's movie isn't a remake, it's a different adaptation of a common source material. With the Evil Dead franchise finished, it's time for some holiday cheer, so we're starting Silent Night, Deadly Night next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank patron Flynn Lambert and other patrons who have been with me for over a year. Brian Crocker, Riley Affield, Kieran Nichols, Charles Mueller, and Dried Lemon? The Evil Dead franchise is over, and it's definitely one of my favorite franchises. I didn't even realize how much I loved those first two movies till I covered them on The Kill Count. And Army of Darkness and the remake aren't bad. Thanks everyone, be good people.